we're going to be talking about eschatology. Eschatology is the fancy theological term for the study of the end times. What's going to happen in the, 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 when, the, when the end times come at the last days in this world. And um, so we're going to go through this study. And I'm going to teach it to you as I learned it in doctrine. Uh, in Bible college. I, I figure all of you are at least as smart as I am, probably not smarter, and, um, and so you're going to be able to understand it just as well as I could, and so I'm not going to dumb it down for you. I'm not going to uh, pull it back. We're just going to go through, we're going to talk about, we're going to use the theological terms because you'll hear those terms and you need to understand what they are. We're going to look straight at the scriptures. We're going to look at the facts, not the, um, not the, uh, the things that are fantasies or the things that are kind of uh, uh, great and all there's a lot of things get out there you know this this guy's the antichrist and this is uh you know all these different conjectures uh, well well that's not what we're gonna be looking for we're gonna look for exactly what the bible says and what we can see in the times that we have today and so we're not going to sensationalize going through the eschatology like sometimes you hear it hear it happen and uh, so we're going to start here, first of all, looking at some terms that we're going to use. One of the problems is I'm going I'm to talk about one thing, and when I talk about that, I've got to talk about something else that I'm going to teach about later. And uh, so what I'm going to do is try to define my terms briefly here, and then we'll go back through and give them a much deeper uh, study and understanding of what those terms are. And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 13, the Bible says, um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope and and so paul says listen i I don't want you to be ignorant i don't want you to be stupid i want you to understand uh, about this time period the end times as much as you're able to now the truth is that we're limited on what we can understand um, God has only revealed so much to us, and, and some of it is in terminology that uh, we don't fully understand, and, and so we're limited on what we can understand, but what we can understand, we should not be ignorant of that. And the primary thing that we need to understand is this, Jesus is coming again. And when he comes again, he's going to bring uh, a new world and, uh, and a new life and eternity and all the rest of it. But there's a, there's a whole process involved in that. Now, the first term you'll see there in your notes is number one there is the day of the Lord. Whenever you see that phrase, the day of the Lord, or also sometimes called that day or the day or great day. Those are all phrases that are synonymous with each other. And it, when you see that term, it's not talking about a specific day. It's not talking about one day. It is referring to a period of time. You know, and, and you know, like sometimes we'll say, well, you know, in that day when I retire or back in the day when I was younger, uh, we're not referring to a specific day. We're referring to a, a time period. And, and that's the same thing. So whenever you read the day of the Lord, you're referring to a period of time that begins with the rapture. Now, if you look on the back of that same paper, you'll see on the back there is a chart. And imagine that chart. Uh, the top two are connected to each other. They're, they're one long chart, okay? I had to cut it in half in order to fit it and be able to read it, and I could barely read it as it is. And then the other one kind of explains some of these chart terms again as well. So you see the time. Uh, it starts with the rapture. That's the beginning of the day of the Lord. And then you have the tribulation period. Then you have the second coming of Christ. And then you, from there, we have the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then there's the millennium, which is the thousand-year reign here on the earth. And then we have the final rebellion and the great white throne judgment. And then eternity begins at that point. And so all of that is, is dealt with in that phrase, day of the Lord. It can refer to all of it or part of it. And, and so sometimes it gets confusing. Well, what part is it referring to? And you have to look at the context, and you have to also um, kind of go through and, and study it out a little bit and determine, is he talking about a whole time period, or is he talking about one part of that time period? But the day of the Lord refers to all of that. Now, primarily, it's talking about, the, primarily in most passages, it's specifically focusing on the second coming of Christ. All right? And then you have another phrase, number two there, which is the last or the latter days. And that's a little different in that it refers to the end of the church age or the age of grace. Now, what do we mean by the age? We believe that God has what we call dispensations. And dispensations are different time periods 
where God has dealt with save man the same way. Now, I want to make something very clear. Man has always been and always is saved the same way, and that's by grace through faith, uh, is by having faith. The Old Testament believer, they had faith in the coming Messiah, the Savior who is to come. You and I today, we have faith in the Savior who's already come. We're both looking at the same person, Jesus Christ, in our faith, but from different sides of the cross. And throughout ages, man is always saved the same way, not through their works, not through their religion, not through anything else, but trusting Christ and believing in the Savior, the Messiah. Okay, so that's important to remember. But a dispensation was a time period where God dealt with believers, saved man differently. For example, we have the dispensation of innocence, and that was in the garden with Adam and Eve. Um, During that time, God actually walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, has God ever walked with you in a garden? Now, I've been out in, you know, in a garden or someplace out in the wilderness and felt like God was right there, but God has never physically walked with me. God has not given me the responsibility to tend in the garden, which is good because I kill plants all the time. Um, so uh, that's not my relationship with God is not based upon that dispensation. And their, their responsibility was to tend the garden and to not eat of the fruit of good and evil. And then you have the dispensation. There's a number of them I'm going to skip over, but you have the dispensation of the law. And that was when he gave Israel the, the Ten Commandments and all the sacrifices and all the law. And all of that was not for salvation. They were still saved by believing in the promise of a Messiah to come. But what it was is that, that they were to obey the law. They were to obey the, the keep the sacrifices and bring the sacrifices to the temple. And... Um, so you have these different dispensations. There's, we believe there's about seven different dispensations. And what they are just God dealt with man differently during those dispensations. We today don't have to obey the laws in the same sense they did. We don't have to eat. We can't, we don't have, we can't eat unclean. We eat pork. Uh, we don't have to keep the clean laws. We don't have to bring sacrifices to the temple. We don't do that because that was for the nation of Israel during that specific time period and, um, and, and their responsibility uh, in doing that. Now, why? Why do we have these different time periods, the different ages or dispensation? It's because um, what it is is that God, when, when, when we stand before God, every mouth will be stopped. And, and, and so God basically works with men differently, but they never obey. In the garden, I mean, I've had people tell me, well, if God would just come down and I could see him face to face and talk to him, I'd, I'd obey him. Well, Adam and Eve did that. They had that and they disobeyed. And then I've had other people say, well, why doesn't God just tell me what he wants me to do? Just give me a list of rules. Well, he did that in the Old Testament law, and they disobeyed. Now we're in the age of grace. And later on, we'll have the the age of the millennial, the thousand-year reign, the kingdom age is called. And during that time, it's going to be perfect. The world, there's going to be nothing bad in the world. No sickness, no disease, uh, no fighting, no uh, famines, nothing as bad is going to happen. And I've had people say to me, well, you know, if it was just a perfect world, I'd believe in God. Well, for a thousand years, it's going to be a perfect world, and men is still going to rebel against God. And so uh, God is just proving no matter what I do, it's not going to make a difference. And God's showing us that. And, and, and a part of it also is the growing up of mankind. Um, I dealt with my diff- children differently when they were children. You know, when they're two, three, four, five years old, you deal with them differently than when they turn teenagers. And then when they become young adults, you deal with them differently also. There's different ages in your relationship with your children. And God is just, as we as, as a people grow up, uh, God deals with us differently. And so um, it's just understanding that. And again, we go through a whole section on that in theology, and I'm not going to try to do that here. But the thing to understand is that the last or latter days, that's referring to the church age, which is right now. We're in the age of grace or the church age. And that started at the cross, and it will end with the rapture. And so when you read the phrase latter days, that means after the age of grace is when that ends towards the end of the church age is referred to that. So it could be a little before the rapture, just before the rapture. So in the in the latter days, there's going to be more wars in the latter days. These things are going to happen. These are signs that the end times are coming. And so it's, it's really referring to that time period right before the rapture and maybe a little bit after that. Now, it can also refer to the last days of Israel just before the second coming. 
Remember, Israel and the church are two separate. They're not, the church is not the New Testament Israel. The Israel and the church are two separate. What God did at the end of the Old Testament when the age of grace started, God kind of took Israel and he put them up on a shelf. And he says, I'll deal with you later. And he then began to, that was when the church age began, the Gentiles and Jewish believers and all. And then when the rapture happens, God's going to reach up there and take Israel off the shelf and they're going to come back into the forefront. And, and, and they're going to be there up until right before the second coming. That's the latter days of Israel. That's when their, their time is coming to an end as well. And so that's what the latter days is referring to. And again, remember, we're going to come back and go into more detail on these. But I've got to kind of give you definitions so you can understand as we work through these. Number three is the rapture. Now, the rapture is not, the word rapture is not found in the Bible. You go from Genesis to Revelation, the word's not there. It's a theological term. It's one that we, we came up with this word to describe what is in the Bible. And what the rapture refers to, the word rapture is, comes from the Latin word meaning, meaning caught up. It, it's, a, and it's basically the translation of all believers from this world to new bodies as they are caught up to meet the Lord in the air right before the tribulation begins. Okay, now follow along here if you can. We're, we're right now in the church age. What's going to happen next is the rapture. And when the rapture comes, Jesus is going to come in the air, but he's not going to come to the earth. He comes to the earth at the second coming, different time, later on. He's going to come in the air. The trump is going to sound. There's going to be a shout. And all of those who are, first of all, the dead shall rise first. Now, does anybody know why the dead rise first? Anybody? because they have six feet further to go. Okay, um, that was a joke, by the way, all right? So the dead are going to rise first, and then we which are alive shall follow them. And that's going to be almost, in our sight, it's going to be instantaneous. It's going to be so quick one after the other. It's not, we're not going to be able to see the difference. It's in the blink of the eye, not even the blink of the eye. It's in, in kind of the, 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 the flash of the eye. It's, it's a quick thing that's going to happen. And all the believers are going to be raptured out of this world. You've probably seen that in movies or the, the books on the second coming that were very popular a while back. Uh, the people disappear and their clothes are left in a pile on the floor. You know, pilots and airplanes disappear and the airplane crashes and all the rest of that. And, um, and, and so that's all going to happen at the rapture. That's what the rapture is referring to and, um, and going with that. Now, you'll hear sometimes people talk about a partial rapture, which is not true, okay? A partial rapture belief is that people believe only those saints who are worthy will be raptured. Everybody else will stay through the tribulation. So they say well, only the good people, the good Christians will get raptured. All the bad ones, they have to go through the tribulation. And that's not biblical. We'll look at that. There's other beliefs about the rapture. But we believe that all Christians, all believers, if you're saved, will be taken up in the rapture. Okay? Number four is the tribulation or called the great tribulation. And that's seven years of God's wrath and judgment on the earth during the rule of Antichrist. Now, if you've ever studied that, you know there's about three and a half years where there's relative peace, but that's when the Antichrist is taking control of everything, and uh, people are, you know, have to, will get the mark of the beast, and they'll, uh, the, if they want to eat, they've got to go to the Antichrist government, they've got, you know, that's where he takes control of everything, and then the last three and a half years, there's going to be some tribulation during that first three and a half, but the last three and a half is going to be terrible. You think things are bad in this world today. It's going to be like having earthquakes, famines, war, and tsunamis all at the same time. It's going to be a very, very destructive time on earth. And, uh, and, and, and so we're talking about seven years. Now, in that seven years, there's the, the tribulation. There's three different basic beliefs. And again, we'll talk about what the right one is, what we believe the right one is. But there's what are called pre-tribulationists. Now, a pre-tribulationist is somebody that believes the rapture is going to take place before the seven-year so, period of tribulation. So when that seven years begin, we as believers are going to be taken out before that seven years starts. That's called a pre-tribulation rapture. And, and that's basically where I, I fall in that camp uh, that believes that the rapture is going to happen. And we'll explain why later on uh, we believe that. But there's a pre-tribulation rapture. And then there's a, a mid-tribulation rapture. Today, it's often called a pre-wrath rapture. 
And what they believe is that we'll go through the first three and a half years, and then at the middle, that three and a half year point, the Christians will be raptured out, and then the last three and a half years, we won't be there for that. Okay? And then the third belief is a post-tribulationist. They believe that the rapture ha happens after the tribulation. So we'll go through all seven years, and then we'll be raptured out at the same time Jesus comes again. Okay? Now, we basically are pre-tribulation, and we'll show you the scriptural basis we believe that on, uh, and we'll explain why these other beliefs are there and going through that as well. Okay, then number five, the judgment or the bema seat of Christ. The judgment or the bema seat of Christ. Does anybody know what the word term bema? How many have heard of that before? You heard the word bema? It's, it's a biblical term, the bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat. The bema seat was when they would give out the rewards at the Olympic Games. And it was not so much a negative judgment as it was a positive judgment. There was a loss at that judgment, but it was more about the reward of the judgment as well. And, and there's a lot of misunderstanding on the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment of the believer's works for reward or loss of reward based on their works, words, thoughts, and motivations, both good and bad. Okay, so there's two judgments, and we'll talk about the second one in just a moment. There's the Bema Seat of Christ, which is going to happen during, while the seven years tribulation is going on, on the earth, we'll be in heaven, we'll be raptured, we'll be up there, and we're going to have, during that time period, one of the things that will happen is the judgment seat of Christ. And you and I as believers will be judged, not whether we go to heaven or hell. That's the great white throne judgment, which comes way at the end of the thousand-year reign. That's when people are cast into hell. They're judged of whether they trusted Christ or not. If they have Christ, they have life. If they don't have Christ, they don't have life. The Bema Seat of Christ is only for Christians. It's not whether you go to heaven or hell, but it's about reward and loss. There's no... There's no negative in that we're going to be whipped or put in jail or something like that in that sense. But the negative is the, is the negative is the loss and realizing what we could have done for Christ. And there's four things that will be judged there. The first thing is we'll be judged according to our works. And again, we'll give you the scriptures on this when we get that in the notes. We'll be judged according to our works. So everything that I do is going to be judged at the Bema Seat of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3, it talks about both the good and the bad are going to be revealed. And so the good things that I do is going to be there at the Bema Seat of Christ, but also the bad things that I've done are going to be there. Now, there's one exception to that, and I'll tell you in just a moment. Second thing we'll be judged is our thoughts. Not just what I did outwardly, but what my thoughts were. Third thing that will be judged is my um, motivations. Okay, why I did what I did. And I didn't put it in here, but our word, I forgot to skip words. Words, thoughts, motivations, all those will be judged. So God's going to say, here's what you did, but let's look at why you did that. You gave money and offering, but you did it for the praise. Or you served in this position, but you did it for the wrong, you know. Why did you do what you did, the motivation as well? Now, the one thing that will not be judged is what I've already confessed. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if I confess it, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells me I will not be judged for it because I've already confessed it and I've already got it right with God and God says he's going to forget it as far as the east is from the west. Okay? So if we confess it, we won't be judged. But if we don't confess it, we will be judged for both good and bad. For the good that I do, I'll be rewarded. God's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He's going to reward me. We'll talk about those rewards. The rewards primarily deal with the thousand-year reign. During the thousand years where Christ is the king of the world, during that time period, we will rule with him. And those who have been faithful will be given more responsibility. Those who have not will, be given, will have loss. And remember, the tears do not get wiped away until way after that thousand years. So there can still be some crying in realizing I could have served the Lord better. I could have done better in my walk. The worst thing about the judgment seat of Christ is this, is having to stand before Jesus and everything's revealed. Now, he already knows it. But 
when I say reveal, it's, do you remember when you were a kid and you say a bad word and your mom said, tell me the word you said? Wasn't that terrible to have to say that bad word in front of your mom? To say what you said? And, and that's what's me. Jesus is going to look at us and say, why did you do that? Why did you, why did you have those thoughts? Why did you say that thing? Why did you gossip? Why did you say bad things about this other person? Why did you, all that's going to be revealed. Now, I don't know how it's going to be revealed. There's a lot of people that are going to have to reveal. When I was a kid, there was a show on TV called This Is Your Life. And they would bring people in there, and they would play recordings of their old teacher, and they would show pictures of them, and show their, this was your life, and they'd show their whole life, you know, highlights from their whole life. So I don't know, he's going to have a big screen up there. I don't know if it's going to be revealed in our minds that we're just going to be able to see it, and, and, and our, you know, I don't know if everybody else is going to be able to see it. If I'm going to stand there with everybody else around me, and, and, and they're going to see it, you know, that was one of the worst things, too, as a kid. When, when I'd get in trouble, my brothers and sisters would be right there, <laughs> listening to me get, you know, get in trouble and hear what I did. And, and so I don't want to have to have that happen. I want to hear him say, well done, now, good and faithful servant. Here's, here's this, like, I'll have somebody come to me, a couple, a guy, guy, a guy or a woman comes to me and says, I, I'm gonna, you know, my wife wants a divorce, and so I'm, just, I'm giving up. And I tell them this. I said, listen, if I ever had to get a divorce, which I know that I will never get divorced, and the reason I know that is because my wife does not believe in divorce, but she does believe in murder. She'd kill me before she divorced me, okay? So, but if I ever had to get divorced, I'd want to be able to stand before God and I want to be able to say, God, I did my best to make it work. I was not perfect, but I did my best to make it work. The Bible says, as much as lieth in you, live peacefully with all men. And I did my best to make that situation work. And so whatever God, whatever God shows me, I want to be able to say, I did my best. Or here's the other thing I want to be able to say to him. People ask me, well, do you think it's right or wrong for me to do this? And I say, listen, imagine one day you're saying before God. And God looks at you and says, why did you do that? The, the answer God's not going to want to hear is, well, Pastor Wayne said it was okay. Mm -mm. Or everybody else did it. Mm -mm. You know what the answer is going to hear? Because I proved what's acceptable unto you. I looked up what is your good and said, I believe this is what you wanted me to do. I might be wrong, but at least if I could say that to them, that would be a lot better. And so that's the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be judged as Christians, not whether we go to heaven or hell, but whether we receive reward or loss. It's not just going to be a little slap, bad, bad boy, and now come on in, have a good time. There's a loss involved, and we'll see that. And the primary loss is, number one, not hearing him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Number two, not having those crowns or trophies to lay at his feet and give back to him. And number three is we will not have the privileges and responsibilities that others will have during that millennial reign. And so there is loss. Because you ever hear somebody say, well, you know, Christians, they can do whatever they want, and they're going to get away with it, get to heaven, and God's going to be a bad boy, and then you're going to go to heaven for all eternity. I can live with that. But there's a loss. But there's also reward. And we ought to look forward to the judgment of Christ, because that's when we get to stand for and say, God, I love you. And I tried to live my life based upon that. Okay. And again, we're going to go through this in a lot more detail. Next one there is the number six, the second coming of Christ. Okay, so we have the rapture, the tribulation in heaven. We've got the um, judgment seat of Christ. That ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb. God says, okay, I, that's enough. And he sends his son down to the second coming of Christ. That's when Jesus comes all the way to the earth. And he brings us as a mighty army. We're the army of God. And that's all happening. So it's Jesus returned to earth as a conquering king, leading a mighty army of believers at the end of the tribulation period. Now, the thing is, we're the army, but we're gonna do, we're gonna not, Jesus is going to do all the fighting. He's the one that's going to get the victory. But we're going to be there with him. All right? That's the second coming of Christ. So rapture, second coming are two different things. They're bookends to the seven years tribulation. Okay, next one is the millennial kingdom. The word millennial means thousand years. Thousand. It's a thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. Um, it begins after the second coming and ends at the final rebellion of Satan and the great white throne judgment. Faithful Christians will rule with him during that time. Okay? So he's going to rule. It's going to be a perfect world. No sin. 
no sickness, no famine, none of that is going to happen. A thousand years of perfect world. At the end of that thousand years, there's going to be a group of people that will rebel. Now you say, well, who are they? It's not us. Because we've already been to heaven. We've already got our new bodies. We get our new bodies at the rapture. Uh, we're changed at that point. We get our new bodies. We're already set. During the tribulation, during that seven years, there are going to be people getting saved. There's going to be a base group of 144,000. They're not Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? That's going to be the base group that gets saved first. And then they're going to go out and spread the gospel throughout the world during that seven years. And a lot of people are going to get saved. And they, those people physically, in the, the bodies like you and I have, are going to go into the millennial age. And God's going to you know, give their bodies the ability to last longer. They're going to have children. And some of their children are the ones who are going to rebel. So people are, children are going to be born during this time period, not to you and I, because we're already in our new bodies. We don't have marriage like we do here. You won't be having children. But those people got saved during tribulation. They will have children. And some of those children or grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren rebel against the king, even though it's a perfect world. Okay? And then, um, so again, there's three different views on millennial. There's the premillennials who says the rapture and tribulation and second coming will occur before the millennium. So all this happens, and then the thousand years starts. There's the amillennialists. They do not believe in a literal earthly millennium. They believe the kingdom is in our hearts right now. We're part of the millennium. And, and God wants to rule in our hearts. And if we really obey God and we really do well, we can bring a perfect world into being. That's the amillennials belief. And then you have the post-millennials who believe the second coming is after the millennium. And again, we're going to go into all this. I'm just trying to give you some definitions. So please, if, if some of it's confusing, hold on. And then the last thing that's going to happen is the great white throne judgment. And that's the judgment of the unsaved will be brought before God. Every mouth will be stopped, no excuses. And if their name's not found written, there's books are open. And one of the books is the book of life. If their name is not written in there, they're cast into hell for eternity. Now, here's the thing that I believe, and I'll show you why. I believe you and I will be there. And I believe we're going to have, this is where some of the tears are going to come, because we're going to be standing there, and I'm going to watch, there's my uncle that I never witnessed to. And there's my neighbor that I never cared enough about to tell about Jesus or invite him to church. And there's my coworker. And we're going to watch those people be cast in hell. And the tears are going to still come because the tears aren't wiped away until after that. You see, we've got this kind of utopian idea that when we, you know, when we die, we're going to go to heaven. God's going to say, why didn't you live for me? Well, I don't know, Lord. I just didn't really feel like it. Well, okay, come on in. Have a great time. And we've got this, we will for eternity. After the great white throne judgment, eternity starts, all tears are wiped away, everything is perfect, but there's a thousand and seven years where there could be a lot of tears and regrets and realizing how many failed opportunities we had. And that's important for us to realize. Does that make sense? So those are some definitions. And then the chart in the back kind of just charts it out for you. And it gives you some more definitions there in there as well. And you might want to go over this on your own. Now, what I'm going to do with, with this study we're having now with this, with our Ephesians book, we would stop and ask questions and you would respond. That was very difficult for people watching online because a lot of silent type because they couldn't hear your questions. I had to repeat them out loud and everything. So in this class, as we do this now, I'm going to teach the lesson and then we will stop and let you ask questions at the end of the lesson. Now, we're not quite to the end yet. We got a little bit more to go here. But since I've asked, since I've covered these right now, is there any questions you have? Again, we'll explain more later, but maybe you say, I, I don't understand this, or could you explain that again uh, a little bit more? Or what do you mean by this? It, just looking at these definitions, is there any basic questions or even comments you have right now that you want to ask or, or bring out? And I'd love to get you asked some questions, so don't, don't be bashful to do that. Uh, I had a lot of questions when I started this class that I didn't know the answers to. And, um, and, and so don't feel bad if you don't have the answers. That's what we're going to try to do in this class is give you more answers. And so don't be embarrassed to ask a question. Has anybody got a question or a comment on any of those things we covered so far? Yes, sir.
Um, when you say confess our sins, do you mean like we specifically have to ask for forgiveness of a particular sin? Or like sometimes when I start off my prayer, I say, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. I think, I think the, the, when you study First John and Psalm 51 and other places talks about confessing our sins, I do think that there's this specificity that has to be there in the sense of, Lord, what I said today was wrong or the way I treated my wife was wrong, or what, what I did was wrong, this was sin. Um, I think we, we need to confess the individual sin. Uh, I do think that there's times that we can, we can confess it kind of a little more. I mean, if I spent time confessing all my individual sins, I'd probably spend my whole day doing that, unfortunately. Uh, you know, so sometimes we can confess them as a little bit of a group, but it's not like we can come to the end of the week or the end of the month and say, well, God, forgive me all my bad sins. It's not generic, it is specific. It's a, the, the idea is agreeing with God. So again, let's use the illustration of my children. When they would be bad, I would, I would say, okay, what did you do? I wanted the name. I hit my brother. I, I said something I shouldn't have said. I, I threw a temper tantrum or whatever it was they did, or I broke something or whatever. I want them to name that what they did, and I want to acknowledge that it's wrong. And, and, so, and so it's not the, I'm sorry, you know, type thing your kids would have. It's, it's a very specific, God, what I did was wrong. And I know that. And I ask you to forgive me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So it's, it's looking at myself saying, what I did was wrong. And, and I am judging myself. I am saying it was wrong. And I, I'm guilty. And I'm acknowledging that guilt. Um, not just to get out of the punishment, but to, but to truly realize it's wrong. So it's not a generic thing, it's more, very much more specific. Okay? I do think there are times you can go back in your life, but here's the problem. I don't remember what I did last week very well. I remember I did some bad things maybe, but I, I can't always be as specific as I need to. And that's why we need to keep short accounts. As soon as we realize this was wrong, I need to stop and say, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Not even wait till the end of the day is, is better. Now, at the end of the day, I can go back and look at my day and say, yeah, I could have handled that situation a lot better. And that was really, I was in the flesh, and Lord, that, that was wrong. And then I confessed it to God, and I go back the next day and confess to my coworker or whatever it was I did wrong. Okay? Good question. Thank you. Anybody else? I know I just fed you with a fire hose. I just, all of it will come in at one time. And I, I realized that, but I had to do that to begin with. I've learned in this series, I, I keep having to go back and explain things over and over again. So please keep this chart and this list handy. Because throughout the lesson, you're going to kind of go back. Get yourself a binder or something and put this in there. That way you can go back again and again and look at it again and say, okay, that's what that was, and refer back to that as we go through the whole series and, and dealing with that. And I think that will make a big difference. So I I'd, I'd highly suggest you get a binder and, and uh, to kind of keep up with those things as well. All right, if you look at page number three, we're just going to kind of introduce some things here um, in talking about it. So... The, the definition of eschatology, the word, eschatos, it means last or latter. So when you see the phrase last days, that's eschatos in the Greek. That comes from Greek. And in ology, what does logos mean? Does anybody know? The idea of the Greek word logos. What's that? It means to study. It means study. It can be used for words. Logos is a word. But it's more the idea of to study the words. So anything that you're studying can end in ology. It's, it's uh, you know, you can study medicine. And it can, and, you know, you can end it all in ology is that idea there. So all of our theology series, theology is the study of God. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit, pneuma's spirit. Um, ecclesiology is the study of the church. Ecclesia is the, the Greek word for church. So they're all the study of something, and this is the study of the last or latter times. Now, our knowledge of the specific details is limited. And this is something you really need to get into your head here. Because there's a lot of people, especially on the Internet, and please be very, 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 very care careful when you're on the Internet on anything, but especially if you're studying eschatology of the end times. There's a lot of garbage and stupid stuff on the Internet. And people are saying things. They, they sound intelligent. They sound very intelligent, but they have no idea what they're talking about, and they're definitely not talking about what God talks about. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. 
in verses 6 and 7. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. God says, listen, I'm going to give you enough information. You know it's coming. But not more than that. You're not going to know the day, the time, or the place. And he talks about that other places in the Bible as well. And when we start, what happens is, is people start reading everything. I, I'm 67 years old. In my lifetime, I can't tell how many people I've heard were the Antichrist. This guy's the Antichrist. That guy's the Antichrist. This one's the Antichrist. And everybody, you know, and it just comes up over and over again. Let me tell you one thing I know. I don't know who the Antichrist is, and none of us will until he's revealed. And you know when he's going to be revealed? After the rapture. So if you find out who the Antichrist is, you got a problem. Because the rapture's already happened. We don't know. He may be alive today. He may be in the news today. He may be somebody everybody knows who they are, but they're not going to know he's the Antichrist until he's revealed. And so, it, it, you know, it's not Trump, it's not Biden, it's not Obama, it's not Putin, it's not, you know, any of these guys, we don't know who it is, okay? So we cannot know the identity of the Antichrist. We're not going to know specific dates. There's been people by, I remember there was... Um, 86 reasons why Jesus was going to come in 80, 1986. And then there was another, that, that was a very popular book. It sold a lot of copies. And then in 1987, there was another book that said 87 reasons why he's really coming in 87. Same author. Nobody knows the dates. Nobody knows what's going to happen. And there are certain things we see, like Israel has to come back together as a nation, and that's happened. But that doesn't mean... We don't know fully exactly what that means. Paul the Apostle thought Jesus was going to come again in his lifetime. And Jesus didn't. Doesn't mean he's not going to. It just means it's not in our timing. So we don't, if somebody comes and says, I have a date, whether a specific date or a time period, turn them off, cut them off. That They're done. I'm done with that person. Um, if they say, here's the United States in prophecy, or here's, you know, we can see certain countries in the prophecy, but we don't know that they're like China. When you look at certain descriptions of the Bible, there was no China back in the Bible days, okay? But when you look at certain descriptions, you say, well, that sounds like China, or that sounds like Europe. But I'll tell you one thing there's no indication of in the Bible, and that's the United States in prophecy. Now, what does that mean? We're, we're the most, one of the most prominent countries in the world. Are we going to be gone then? Which can happen. USA can disappear overnight. Or are we not going to be significant? Or are we there and we just don't know it? We don't know. And when somebody says, well, this is the United States, and this is, you know, you, these, were, these countries were not in existence back then. Again, we can see certain directions. This, they're going to they're come from the east. Well, what's east of Israel? China, India. So we know it's coming from that direction. These ones are going to come from the north. Well, what's north of Israel? You can look at a map and figure that out, okay? When, when Europe first came together as a European group of nations, everybody was like, oh, this is fulfilling prophecy. The, the second coming is going to happen next year or two years from now or whatever. It hasn't happened yet. Now, are they going to be part of prophecy? Maybe, but maybe not. We don't know that, and keep that in mind. Uh, we don't know specific details. I, I remember a track a number of years back somebody wrote. It was why Jesus is coming soon. And in the track, there, re there, was, not, there was not a Bible verse. There was not a, a biblical argument. You know what their main argument was? Vultures were gathering in Israel. There were more vultures in Israel than ever before in history. And so God was gathering all the vultures because the battle of Armageddon, so many people were going to die that the vultures were gathering there to eat all the dead bodies. And that was their argument. It was sensational, but it wasn't biblical. Now, are those interesting things? Yeah. Uh, the mark of the Antichrist. What is that going to be? The mark in the, 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 your hand or the mark in your forehead? 
100 years ago, we had, you know, we thought, well, that's gonna, they're going to write it on your head. They're going to write it on your hand. Today, what do we think of when we think of the mark of the beast in your hand? Chip. Because they can do that now. You know, when Social Security numbers first came out, there was a lot of people who said, that's the mark of the beast. And then when those scanning, you know, how you scan your food in the store, when that barcode first came out, that's the mark of the beast. And, and people keep coming up with these things. Does, is it interesting? Yes, that they can put a little chip in you and, and identify who you are, and someday you're not going to need a credit card or anything. You just got to go up there. And if you want to get food, scan your hand. Is he gonna, will the Antichrist use that? Perhaps. Or perhaps it'll be something we have no clue of today. We don't know. Some things are interesting. You go into Revelation and uh, some of the prophecies in the Old Testament, you read about some of the descriptions. When they describe some of the things in there, one of them sounds, sounds just like a helicopter. Uh, somebody back in that day had never seen a helicopter. That's how they would describe one. So are helicopters going to... Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe there's going to be a beast that looks like a helicopter, but it's not. I don't know, and you don't know, and the guy on the Internet does not know. So be careful of sensationalism, okay? It's interesting. You watch the news every time, you know, I'll watch the news. And my wife is right now teaching on end times in her ladies' Bible study class. And she's always bringing, hey, did you see this? You see that? And I, yeah, that's interesting. It is interesting. And we ought to pay attention to that. And I think the world is more and more coming. I think the pandemic was one of the ways that is preparation for the Antichrist. But is it the Antichrist? No. But is the way that, that the world's being prepared to accept that? Yeah. I mean, how is the world going to explain thousands and thousands and thousands of people just disappearing? It's going to be hard to explain. But I believe there's things today that are coming together to make it where it's going to be. They're gonna, people, are gonna, people believe anything nowadays. I mean, I go on the Internet and see some of the things out there, some of the conspiracy theories. And I was like, these guys are nuts. The QAnon and all the rest of that kind of stuff, they're nuts. But all of this is preparation for them to believe the lie of the Satan, the lie of the Antichrist. They're interesting, but it's not biblical. And so separate the sensational from the biblical. These are important things to keep in mind in that way. And so does that mean we ought not to study eschatology? No, we should study it. But study it... I was talking to my son today, and one of the things we were talking about is the fact that there's so many books that are written about eschatology, and, and, and they're arguing over the little details that don't matter. I mean, you know, Daniel, when he describes the, the beast, you know, the, he talks about, I know some people want to describe, you know, I want to tell you what the toenails on the beast are, mean, you know. Be careful. Here's what's most important to know about eschatology. Jesus is coming again, even so come, Lord Jesus. He could come in my lifetime. He could come as a thief in the night. He could come today. He could come tomorrow. So be ready every day. Now, is the rapture first or that second or this or that? Those are all interesting things to know. And there's some things the Bible's very clear on. There's some things the Bible's not clear at all on and there's a lot of things that are somewhere in the middle and some people can read it this way and some people can read it that way and you both might be right and that's okay because that doesn't matter again i i really don't care who the antichrist is going to be i really don't because i'm not going to be here i care who christ is not the antichrist and so there's just some things i'm just i'm not i'm not worried about and then there's other things, you know, there's right now people talking about the monkey pox and all that's another way they're trying to kill people, you know, all the rest of it and stuff. Fine. I can't change that. But you know what Jesus said? Whatever you see coming, just stay faithful. I'm going to use the wisdom God's given me. And during the pandemic, I use wisdom, but people were all over the place during the pandemic about, oh, this is the, the, this is the Antichrist thing, you know, and all the rest of it. Even if it is, it's not going to change anything that I do. And that's important to remember. And just keeping that in mind. But there's a lot of interesting things here. And there's a lot of things that are just fascinating. And there's a lot of things you're going to go, oh. 
Now what I saw this morning in the news makes sense. Oh, yeah, th this is all the preparation for that. And boy, is it. It's, you know, it, 40 years ago, the, the world's a different place. And it's getting worse. And, and every day it gets worse. It's just like, even so, come Lord Jesus. And it could be today. It's, it's closer today than it was yesterday. But I have a, my, the pastor I worked under for a number of years, Pastor Anger, he got saved in the 50s before I was bo even born. And he went to Bible college in the late 50s, early 60s. And he, was, he said, I was so scared. I was so afraid Jesus was going to come again before I got out of Bible college. I would never get a chance to serve the Lord. He said, I wanted Jesus to come again, but I wanted to be a pastor and serve him. And he thought for sure Jesus was going to come in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. Now, should that discourage us? No, because God's not on my time. And he said, listen, I'm not telling you when I'm coming. It's like, when, and I'll finish with this. When my kids were little, I'd say to them, okay, we're going out. We're going to be back. And when we get back, the house better be clean. You guys do not fight with each other. Nobody, you know, and we'd have a whole list of rules. And we'd go. And we didn't tell them what time we were going to be back. And sometimes, you know, the first hour, they were good. The second hour, they were okay. The third hour, they were getting bad, you know. And they're thinking, Mom and Dad are never coming back. Well, we are. And it's on our time, not their time. And we came back. The house better be clean. You better not be fighting. You better, you know. And, and that was expected. If it wasn't, there was going to be a judgment. Now, we weren't going to kill them. Just wanted to a few times. And we weren't going to disown them. But they were going to lose reward. And... If they were good, hey, the house is clean. You guys didn't fight. Let's go get some ice cream. There was a reward. Now, they could sit at home. Okay, we haven't cleaned the room yet, but do you think mom and dad are coming back? Yeah, I see a car. looks like their car. You know, that's not how you live your life. You live your life saying they're coming back, and I just need to be ready when they get here. So let me start now and doing that. Okay? So I hope that makes some sense. Uh, any questions or comments on what we covered today? Again, at the end, I really want you to do this. I want you to ask questions. And you may think, well, he's going to talk about that later. That's okay. The, the cyclical is how I learn. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little, the Bible says. I want to keep coming back around to these things and covering them again and again. And so feel free to ask questions or feel free to share comments or little things that you've come up with there as well. Okay, anybody? All right. Well, thank you for being out tonight. I hope it was a good study for you. Encourage others to join us either here or online. And you can always catch it online. It's always available on our YouTube and Facebook page if you miss a lesson, you want to keep up with that. Thank you very much.